I will wish to greet each and every one of you in uh, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, as we have done so this morning, I wish to also greet you a happy Mother's Day. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask, are we still planning on playing that special music? Okay. So, uh, but before we do that, I want to uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, I am 70 Matthew Goodrich, and uh, I am in charge, and uh, our brother, David Van Fleet, is going to give our message tonight. Now, I think the first time I met Brother Van Fleet was uh, in the uh, Kirtland Temple trip in 2005. I met him there. In fact, I think he sat behind me on the bus. But after, after a while, he became the president of the High Priest Quorum and was that for several years. And uh, now, uh, this last year, he was ordained and set aside in the first presidency and as a counselor to our prophet, Terry Patience. And so I ask that your prayers be with him and that you remember him this evening. And I will give our call to worship after this uh, special music that we are going to have um, on holy ground.
for our call to worship this evening. I have chosen from the book of Colossians, chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 12 through 17, 19, and 23 through 24. And I picked this because I figured uh, most of the main scriptures that we use for Mother's Day would have been used this morning, and I was correct. But I thought, thought this fit with, uh, with this theme, and, and it's how we need to be every day. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And because it's Mother's Day, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. May his uh, spirit be with us in the reading of this uh, call to worship. And now we will turn to our hymnals, number 400, and we will sing this as our opening hymn.
again, we apologize for that. Uh, had difficulty getting that hymn up. But anyways, at this time, we will have uh, the invocation. Our Heavenly Father, we come before thee this evening, and once again, we are thankful that we are able to come into your presence. Even though, Lord, we are scattered in all our homes and uh, in all our places in this country and in this world to watch this uh, broadcast of this service, we pray that your spirit will still be with us. And I pray, dear Father, that the spirit which is here will flow through this broadcast to all the homes that are participating and are watching this broadcast. Father, I pray again for my brother David that your spirit will be upon him, that when he brings the word this evening that your spirit will rest upon him, that, Father, he might freely speak the words which you have placed upon his heart, that we might be lifted and that we might be touched, and that, Father, you will bless us all with these words. So with this invocation, Lord, we come before thee, and again we thank thee, and we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I set forth an offertory for this uh, service uh, for two reasons. One, so that we can uh, show, again, the methods of um, giving to the church. I know you've heard it many times, especially during this pandemic, that things go on and they don't end. And uh, so we continue to need... Uh, your giving. And I see that on the screen now is the methods of which we can give. Um, not having a copy before me, I remember some of the ones is that uh, we can mail it in to the address that is there. We can bring it in to the office. And I understand there's even methods to where we can uh, get on our electronic devices and give through them. So let us remember the needs of this church. Let us remember the commandments that God has given us that we need to participate in this. And so let us remember this so that this church can remain strong and that it can grow. And at this time, I want to uh, say a prayer over these offerings so that they can be used according to God's will. Our Heavenly Father, we come before Thee, and we thank Thee, Lord, for Your blessings. We thank Thee for those things that You have placed within our possession in our walk of life. Father, please be with us that we might be faithful in giving to Thee, and that uh, what we give, Lord, will be in abundance for Your purposes. And I pray that they will be used in that manner. And as always, dear Father, I hold them up before thee that uh, that is responsibility to, to see to the use of these monies. So bless them so that it may always be done according to your direction, according to, to and for your purposes, dear Father. And we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's our one year anniversary. Congratulations to all of you who are getting your 12 month pens. Richard, why don't you read what it says there? Uh, okay, it says <laughs> our mission statement. We love our moms, but we are not our moms. Let's all say that together. We love our moms, but we are not our moms. Progress reports, who'd like to share? I'm sure. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel. Hi, Rachel. I am very excited to share that I have not posted a picture of my food on Instagram in over three weeks. Oh, nice. 
I am now limiting myself to only four coupons per shopping trip. Oh, and I've stopped referring to every cashier as honey or sweetie. Let me tell you, that is a struggle. Yeah, I started buying my own napkins instead of taking them from restaurants. Oh, Shannon's gonna be late. And she sent me a text with 16 different emojis. 16? Okay, well, we'll discuss that later. A anyone else? Okay, well, what things are still giving you difficulty? Whenever I'm in a vehicle and the driver pushes the brakes, I always grab the dashboard like we're gonna die or something. I stay up at night worrying about whether my friends are taking all their vitamins. I daydream about having just five minutes to myself. Don't you live alone? Yeah, it's weird, right? Sometimes I still ask my friends if they have to go potty. They're all adults. I put up shelves just so I can put little knickknacks on them. Hi, sorry I had to drop my sister off at dance and then I had to bring the dog to the groomer, which is right before my voice lesson, and then I had a meeting. Okay, I'm gonna stop you right there. Who can tell me, what was Shannon's mistake? Overbooking. She overbooked. Too many activities. <sighs> right. So even though you're still working through some of these things, it just shows that your mom is part of who you are. And that includes all of their love, their devotion, the heart of God that now lives in you. And remember, you can still be hip and cool. I even started playing that video game, Fork Knife. Uh, Fork Knife? I think you mean. Is that some kind of culinary game? Oh, the one where you crush all the candy. How does this always happen? Carol, just a reminder, there's no dancing during group time. But why? Because I said so, that's why. It's good to uh, be with you this evening. I'm sure for many of you, it's been a very busy day, and I appreciate you joining us for this service. I have uh, three pretty short scriptures this evening. Uh, first one is Exodus uh, 20, verse 12. I think you'll recognize it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The next one is from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, or I'm sorry, 6 verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And finally, from 1 Timothy 5, 1 to 3. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Before we uh, play this uh, next special music, which is called Creation, will be at peace. I wanted to say something about this uh, because this has been special to me for the last month or so, and so I chose it uh, for this evening. The first time I heard this hymn, we sang it at the 2005 conference in the choir, and uh, it was one that President Fred Larson had requested to be sung. And it talks about and deals with the earth at the time that Zion comes. Hence, creation will be at peace. And uh, this song has uh, taken prominence in my mind this last month or so. And I just felt led by the Spirit to use it because Zion is still a big heart and center of the work of this church and it is important to us and so I think it's uh, 
no chance that this has come strong in my mind because I think those days are soon approaching. So as we listen to this song, listen to the words and think of it in this context. Thank you. Creation will be at peace. That's a very uh, applicable uh, song to be sung at this time of year. You know, we've had some really strong wind and some severe thunderstorms and some cold and some even some very warm days. But when we have a nice day this time of year, to me it's like uh, paradise, what that will be like in the next life. I really love this time of year. Uh, in the uh, Ephesian scripture that I read, it referred to what is the fifth commandment. And you notice that it said that uh, that commandment is one that has a promise. And uh, that promise is that uh, if you honor your mother and your father, that you have a good chance of living a long life. Well, you know, it's pretty obvious how that is true. If uh, you tell a child, don't play in the street, and they obey you, their chance of surviving to an older age really improves a lot. And so, you know, we've all disobeyed uh, our parents. We've disobeyed God from time to time. But uh, the commandment is that we honor our parents. Now, as you already know, this is Mother's Day, 
And so to honor our mothers is half of the commandment. And, you know, we should really honor our parents every day, but uh, at least on this day, we're going to do that. I just finished watching some DVDs on public speaking, and one of the major points that the teacher made was that you've got to make your talk personal. And so in some of my remarks today, I'm going to share some family history, even though I didn't necessarily know all of my family. It's, some of this is from notes that I've seen uh, from the past. You know, there's two aspects to honoring our parents. When we're young, we are to obey them. Uh, as we get older, the aspect might be to care for them. And then uh, after they have passed, we can continue to honor their memory. And we're just a couple of weeks away from Decoration Day or Memorial Day when a lot of people lay flowers on the graves of those that have gone on. To honor someone is to regard with great respect. I think sometimes uh, all of us, when we were youth, we tend to overestimate our own knowledge and underestimate our parents' knowledge. I can remember how this was true in my life. Uh, there was a, a point where my mother was a women's leader in our congregation at that time, and I remember that she was getting frustrated uh, by some of the things that she was encountering. I remember as a, probably a young adult or maybe an older teen, I can't remember exactly, I was a little critical in my mind, not that I said anything, but I was a little critical that she was just too sensitive. Well then later on when I had some leader pos leadership positions of my own, I realized that uh, yes, there are frustrations in leadership and perhaps I shouldn't have been so judgmental. You know, uh, my mother, had rheumatic fever as a child at age six and at age 16 again. And she was sick for almost a year each time, missed school for almost a year. And uh, as a result of this, um, her, she had a weak heart. Uh, I think only her physician probably knew this, but uh, she was retaining water, retaining fluid. She had a relative that was very critical of her for being overweight through the years. I remember a number of times hearing about that. And uh, in 1993, in fact, it was the day we were moving into our present house, um, she was very upset, uh, my mother was, and she came in and revealed to us that she had congestive heart failure. Uh, at that point, uh, her doctor uh, put her on a diuretic and she lost all kinds of weight, and it turned out she wasn't overweight at all. Another example of how we can be so judgmental, and we're even judgmental of our parents, and we need to be careful about that. You know, there's a saying about walking in someone else's moccasins, and we need to remember those kinds of things. I know that for some it's hard to uh, honor their parents based perhaps on how they were raised, maybe some things happened in their lives that makes it hard. But we should also remember the tremendous sacrifices that they made, the work and the effort they put in on us. And if you think about the mothers that carried a child for nine months and probably being sick quite a few of those 270 days, you can begin to appreciate a little bit of what they went through. And just think of this, we wouldn't exist otherwise. Now we have a daughter-in-law that's expecting uh, next month. And it's been nine and a half years since we've had a grandchild enter our family. So this is uh, kind of exciting again and, uh, and we're gonna have to kind of remember some of the little details about that. But I can say that uh, having a child is a life-changing experience for both the mother and the father, but especially the mother. They definitely deserve more than one day a year to be honored. To honor someone is to be appreciative and to be thankful. 
But our human tendencies are to be oblivious, to take for granted, and to be thoughtless. Now, Jesus healed 10 lepers, as you recall, and these lepers said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And so the Lord healed them, but only one of the lepers returned to give thanks. And he said, when he saw he was healed, he turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Very significant that it was a Samaritan because they were judged by the Jews as being inferior. But yet it was the Samaritan that remembered to be thankful. And another example of why we should not be so judgmental. You know, Jesus honored his parents. Of course, you know the story about how he was teaching the doctors in the temple. His parents were looking for him, and when they finally found him, he said, Knew ye not that I must be about my, my father's business? But it goes on to say that from then on, Jesus was subject to his parents. And it adds a little note in there that Mary kept all of these things in her heart. There was another time, and critics might point to this about Jesus, when his mother and his brothers wanted to talk to him. And uh, he said that, uh, that the people around him were his mother and his brothers, and he didn't go see them. But the thing that we need to remember is that he charged his disciples to go and care for them. When Jesus hung on the cross, there were three Marys at the foot of the cross, and one of them was his mother. Standing next to her was John the Beloved. And Jesus looked down, and he said uh, to John, Behold thy mother. And he said to Mary, Behold thy son. In other words, he was charging them to care for each other, but in particular for John to care for his mother. So he definitely did show honor to his mother. So as I mentioned, I'd like to share some information about some of the mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers uh, in our family. And you know, uh, Nephi talked about being born of goodly parents. I would have to add that uh, that includes grandparents and great-grandparents to an extent. I'd like to begin with talking about my mother's maternal grandmother. Uh, her name was Fanny Matthews with two T's. Now, she was so puny at birth that they carried her around on a pillow. And they didn't bother thinking very hard about a name, so they just called her Fanny. Well, she fooled all the experts, and she lived to age 76. She had 10 children, and she married a man by the name of William James Matthews with one T. So her name change was pretty minor. Now, Fanny heard the gospel preached by J.J. Cornish and John Blackmore in northern Michigan. She uh, immediately accepted the gospel and was baptized. However, her parents disowned her. But over the course of time, all of her siblings except one also united with the church. Now, my father's maternal grandmother was Abigail Maria Austin Van Fleet. And my, uh, when my sister was born, my parents named her Gail. And I think it was a little later that they realized that uh, my dad's grandmother was Abigail. And so they claimed that uh, she had been named for her great-grandmother. Abigail was known as Abby. She was born in 1843, baptized at the age of 20, and was a faithful member of the church throughout her life. Now, her parents were Elijah Austin and Sarah Burton, which is uh, both of those surnames are names known in the church, and Elijah knew Joseph the martyr in Nauvoo. There's a picture that was taken of them that... Uh, hung in my parents' house. I'm not sure exactly how they ended up with it. And when my parents passed, it now hangs in our house. And Abby wrote two letters to the Herald, the church publication. 
One was in 1883, addressed to Joseph Smith III, and the other was to Mother's Home Column in 1889. And in that column, she describes how they had moved to Downey, California, because her husband Nelson had declining health, and they, he thought it might improve in California. But when they moved there, I guess there wasn't much of a church there at that time, and so they felt very isolated in California. And I'd just like to read one little excerpt in this second letter that she wrote. I feel that life has been indeed a school to me, and amid all I have never lost sight of the truth of the gospel of Christ, which has been a source of comfort and strength to me. My lot has been to be the most of my time separated from the saints. So I have not had the privilege of assembling with them in worship, a privilege I always improved when it was possible. Nothing but sickness ever prevented me from assembling at prayer or any meeting of the saints. The interests of the church have always been my interests. Abby died in 1917, uh, nine years before my father was born, and it was about four years after her husband had passed away. The thing I found interesting was that uh, we are kind of in an isolated condition at this time, just as she was at that time. Now, my dad's mother, my paternal grandmother, her full name was Wilhelmina Bertha Kubitsky Van Fleet, but she went by many. She was born in 1886, and I always say that she was ahead of her time because her name was Minnie Van Fleet. Uh, she was baptized in 1914, and she had seven children. Now, the only daughter in the family was Linda Burdutt's mother, Sarah Haas. And my dad, Robert, or Bob, was the youngest of the seven children. Now, you, as you, most of you know, there was a big controversy in the church in 1925. And this affected uh, my family in California. They actually quit going to church for a period of time, and they began to have Sunday school in their home. Now, my grandmother would make them all get dressed in their Sunday clothes, and they would have Sunday school. But fortunately, uh, Albert A. Smith, who was in the first presidency at that time, went to California and he had a communion service in my great uncle's house and all of the family came. And so the family was uh, reconciled with the church at that time and began to return going to church. Now, Linda's mother, Sarah, says that they were so happy when they were able to start going to church again and that they would drive the 20 miles to San Bernardino branch in their car which had knock-kneed tires and uh, they, I guess the car experts would say they had negative camber on their tires. There was a newspaper article that came out in the Ontario Daily Report in Dece on December 29th, 1944. That was toward the end of World War II, but it was still raging. In fact, I think that was about the time of the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, my grandmother and grandfather had four sons in the war at that time, and my dad was about ready to enter the military. This article talked about how they managed in this time having so many sons in the military during the war. And in this article, she says that constant prayer was what she relied on. And she also said that her favorite psalm was Psalm 91, which talks about that very thing about the protection of the Lord. Now, my dad and my father cared for his mother to a great extent. Uh, my grandfather died in 1946. The war had ended, and my father got uh, leave to go to the funeral. And uh, because the war was over, he got an early discharge. So he helped her, and I don't know, maybe some of the others helped as well, but he helped her move to Independence, and she lived on Truman Road, just a couple of blocks west of here for many years. And uh, my dad usually mowed the lawn, so we were over there regularly. And uh, we had a lot of meals there. We'd go down to Miner's Market on Truman Road and Golden Point Hamburgers, right, just right over here. And she liked to make kuchen and uh, potato cakes. 
We had a lot of those. She was faithful in her faith until her life ended in 1970, just before the time of Apollo 13. In fact, it was during conference that year. My uh, mother, uh, her mother was Hester uh, McLean, and uh, her mother, my mother's mother, was killed when my mother was sick, six. When she was crossing the road, she had gone and gotten her a pair of shoes and was walking home and got hit as she was crossing the road. So my mother went and lived with my aunt and uncle in Detroit, and that was during the Depression. So they lost their house because of the Depression, but they were able to buy one very cheaply in Royal Oak, where she lived for the rest of her time and growing up. Now, my mother, in uh, caring for my sister and I, was very faithful in sharing testimonies, experiences. If she heard anyone that related an experience, my mother repeated it to my sister and I. She'd read us Bible stories, and she liked to read out of between the covers of the Book of Mormon and between the covers of the Doctrine and Covenants. And she read all of those things to us. Her favorite reunion ground was Park of the Pines up in northwest Lower Peninsula, Michigan. So, uh, oh, about 15 years ago, my wife and I drove, took a trip, and looked at a number of things from the family, and we went to that reunion grounds, and it was rather a unique experience to finally see something that I'd heard so much about through the years. My mother was never much for novels, but she read church books a lot, and uh, I think the Roy Weldon's book, uh, Go Tell My People, was one she talked about a lot her final few years. My mother was faithful in spite of the trials that she had, uh, her mother getting killed, my father dying in the church collapse, my sister dying of cancer at age 37, her rheumatic fever, and so forth. And I know we all have trials, but it seemed like she had more than her share, but she remained faithful to the gospel. Kay's mother, passed away a year ago on May 1st, just uh, less than a week after President Larson had passed away. And she was uh, very uh, courteous to me all the time, always. And she gave to the church liberally from their farm profits. She was a believer in the gospel, but she was very quiet in our first congregation. And Kay's grandmother was Gladys Heidi, and she just lived a couple of blocks north of here on Union Street. Now, there were a couple of times that Kay and I lived in this neighborhood also, and a number of times we walked from our house over to their house right over here on Union Street, and we'd talk about the state of the church and so forth, so we had many good memories with them as well. So now I'd like to switch and talk about a few of the mothers from the scriptures. Let's start with uh, the first one, Eve. And Adam told her that she was the mother of all living. And that would be true. Now, even though Eve was the first one to sin, she was part of the divine plan. And therefore, this life became a time of probation, but it also a, was a time for blessings as well. And Adam said that uh, he was thankful because his eyes had been opened and that he found joy in this life. But what Eve said was very interesting. She said, were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed. So it's interesting who mentioned the fact that they were able to have children after the fall. It was Eve, who was the mother of all living. And they were very good about teaching their children. Genesis 4, 10 to 12, among those verses it says, and they made all these things known unto their sons and their daughters. Along that line about teaching our children, I'd like to read two other scriptures. Doctrine and Covenants 68, 4a reads, Inasmuch as parents have children in Zion or in any of her stakes which are organized that teach them not to understand the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ the Son of the living God, and of baptism in the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of the hands when eight years old, the sin be upon the head of the parents. And in Deuteronomy 6, 5 to 7, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. 
and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. The next lady I'd like to talk about from the scriptures was Sarah, the, <clears throat> the wife of Abraham. You know, one of the most interesting stories is when these three men visited Abraham. Now, at first you wonder, are well, these men? Well, later you find out they were angels. And they tell Abraham that he's going to have a son. I think Sarah was in her tent at that time. And it says in the scripture that she laughed within herself. Well, the angel knew that. And he commented on it. And he said, to, why do you laugh? And she denied it. However, he said, you did laugh. And then he said this. He asked this question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And of course it wasn't because Abraham had a son at age 80, uh, 100 and Sarah was 90 at the time. Uh, the next uh, mother I'd like to talk about is Sariah, Lehi's wife. Now she was very unhappy with Lehi when he sent her sons back to Jerusalem to get the brass plates. She told him he was a visionary man but Lehi comforted her by saying that the Lord promised the safe return of her sons. And so when they did return, it says she was exceeding glad. And from that experience, she did gain testimony that, in fact, Lehi was a prophet. But think about this. They wandered in the wilderness eight years just to get to Bountiful. That doesn't include the trip to uh, the Western Hemisphere, and she also remained true to the gospel. The next uh, mother I'd like to talk about is Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was told that she was highly favored and chosen. However, in our faith, we don't worship Mary. We do not think that she was immaculate, but we certainly think she was righteous. However, she is not the only one. In the same book of Luke, we find out that Elizabeth and Zacharias, the parents of John the Baptist, they were righteous before God. And Joseph, Mary's husband, is listed as a just man. So, you know, there are many righteous, but only Jesus was perfect because he was divine. Now, as I mentioned before, Mary kept a lot of things in her heart about Jesus. And one of them... Uh, she obviously understood a lot because in the book of John, the first miracle that's recorded is when Jesus and the disciples attended the marriage, the wedding at Cana. And um, Jesus is there and he says, what will thou have me do for thee, woman? And they needed more wine. So Mary said to the servants, whatsoever he tells you to do, see that you do it. And so Jesus asked the servants to fill the water, pot, the water pot, pots with water. But of course, when they were served, they were wine. When Jesus was blessed as an infant by Simeon, uh, it was prophesied that he would be pierced with a spear to the wounding of thine own soul also. So what, uh, what mother could there be that wouldn't be pierced to the soul to see what Jesus went through and fathers as well? Well, the next one I'd like to talk about is Emma, Emma Smith, or Emma Hale Smith. She knew heartbreak as well. She was called an elect lady. She was told to teach the scriptures, and she made the first hymnal in the Restoration Church. Now, her father... Isaac Hale, it's thought that he, perhaps he was Jewish, but it's said that he began to believe in Jesus Christ because of Emma's prayers. Now, Emma was uh, raised as a Methodist, but of course, later she joined with the, the Restoration. Now, Isaac Hale, her father, doubted that Joseph Smith would make a very good farmer, so things weren't going too well between them. So Joseph and Emma eloped, I think you'd say, up to New York to Squire Tarbell's house to be married. 
And it's interesting that uh, from what I read, the family never did embrace the faith that Joseph brought forth. And again, they, Emma had a rough life. Uh, now, she was the first scribe in the translation of the Book of Mormon. And she wrote this about her time translating or being the scribe. I'd like to read this little quote. I am satisfied that no man could have dictated the writing of the manuscript unless he was inspired. In writing for your father, I frequently wrote day by day, sitting at the table close by him. He sitting with his face buried in his hat with the stone in it and dictating hour after hour with nothing between us. The plates often lay on the table without any attempt at concealment, wrapped in a small linen tablecloth which I had given him to fold them in. I once fell to the plates as they thus lay on the table, tracing their outline and shape. They seemed to be pliable like thick paper and would rustle with a metallic sound when the edges were moved by the thumb as one does sometimes thumb the edges of a book. Now, the children, uh, the Smiths lost the uh, twins at one point, and um, John Murdoch's wife had died, and they also had twins, so Joseph and Emma adopted those twins. Well, uh, Joseph was pulled out of his house one night and tarred and feathered, and because the door was open, uh, one of the children, Joseph, one of the twins died from that. I think one of the, uh, perhaps one of my favorite stories about Emma is when the saints were evicted from Missouri and they had to leave from northwest Missouri, cross the uh, northern Missouri in February, and then cross the Mississippi on foot when, the, uh, when it was covered with ice. Now, um, there were four children that were with her, uh, Joseph and Joseph the third, and Julia, the uh, older twin that they had adopted, plus the two younger children that uh, Emma carried, walked across the ice because uh, the man driving the wagon thought it would be unsafe for them to ride in the wagon across the ice. And she also carried the manuscript of the inspired version. That was a, quite a feat. Now, Emma was prophesied, uh, it was prophesied of Emma that she would live a long life. Of course, Joseph was killed in 1844, but she lived till uh, 1879, 35 years later. And then when Joseph III accepted the leadership of our Heritage Church, she went with him to the Amboy Conference. They crossed the Mississippi again, but this time in a boat on April 4th, 1860, and then caught a train to Amboy where he accepted the leadership on April 6th. Now, um, I'd like to close by this in conclusion. The women I have mentioned were firm in upholding the faith. The gospel was central in their lives. In spite of losing a son or being widowed or wandering in the wilderness for years, they kept the faith in the midst of the fray and ran the race required of them. This is a call to repentance to all of us to reevaluate our relationship to the Lord and his work. Let us not follow the pattern set by so many in which generations that followed spiritual stalwarts forgot the ways of truth and turned away from the tenets of the doctrine of Christ. May we finish the marathon that our forebears started and look forward to the time when we can meet them again in the kingdom of God on earth. Thank you, David. At this time, we'll sing in closing... Uh, Hymn 477, 477, let us shake off the coals of our garments.
Heavenly Father, as we come before Thee at the close of this service, we thank you, thank Thee for the spirit that was here. We thank Thee for the message that was given. And Father, may we remember those that have gone forth before us in their courage and their faith in their efforts and their work for Thee. And let us, Father, also remember our own mothers. I pray for them that they might also remain faithful, as well as all of us, Lord, in your stead. I pray that your spirit will be with us in our daily walk and that you will help us in these days that we are in, that we may be able to see them through. Father, until the day comes that we can again come together and worship you together. So, Father, we come before thee and we ask these things and we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We are often told, God loves you. But what does that really mean? That some impersonal force, galaxies away, may consider you from time to time? Or that you are a single drop in a vast ocean of humanity and God cares for all of it? There are billions of lives, billions of stories, can we really believe he has great destinies planned for all of them? Surely the ruler of the universe has more important affairs than to notice the needs of one singular individual. But hear this, nothing could be further from the truth. When God says, I love you, it means that he crafted every detail of your being. Your every feature is His perfect design. His mind perceives your worries and your thoughts. His heart is broken by your pain. You are His child, created in His image. Your value exceeds all the riches of earth. Your worth extends beyond the stars. And though you may be unaware, He's carefully constructing the events of your life to build his kingdom. If you are willing, he can and will achieve wonders through your hands. It is the deepest passion, the most meaningful promise. It is your security, your hope, and your future. It is the truth beyond doubt. God loves you.